Spotlight, Lectures and Performances on and Around Albany State University. This summer we had uh, 10 students and three faculty members travel to China and where they attended Xiamen University. And then also we had Sonique O'Neill who traveled to Paris, France this summer as well. Um, I would like to warmly welcome to our program today the bright students of Albany Middle School. We're so grateful to have you here with us this morning. I would also like to thank <laughs> I would also like to thank Professor Tucker and Dr. Green for participating with us this morning. It's greatly appreciated. Um, I also want to thank you so much for your patience this morning and while we're getting things underway. This morning, our ASU welcome will be done by Professor Tucker. So if you all could please give her a warm welcome. We greatly appreciate it. As indicated, my name is Neota Tucker, and I bring you welcome on behalf of our eighth president, Dr. Everett Freeman, uh, who could not be here this morning. Uh, he is in the airways, not going to exotic places as our students and faculty visit it this summer, uh, he would have wanted to be here. And he would ask me to make sure that the welcome would be twofold. First, we would like to welcome back our faculty and students from distant and far away exciting places. Uh, I understand that uh, they travel to China, to France, Costa Rica, Germany, the Republic of Togo, and I also heard London, I'm not sure. And we will get a chance to hear about those exciting things that they did. It was also noted that nationally, 82% of the students who reported that they participated in study abroad programs were white students. Non-white students were very much underrepresented among the students who study abroad. This has to change. ASU offers special opportunities for our students to study abroad through the ASU Office of Global Programs. And I hope we can continue to offer those programs in greater numbers as the, as the years uh, transpire. Additional benefits from study abroad uh, are very obvious. Uh, this, as I said earlier, is the best opportunity to learn a foreign language, certainly an opportunity to travel uh, far beyond our borders. You learn more about other cultures and you study with diverse groups of people. Hopefully you made friends with people from around the world and certainly that may have happened in China uh, this past summer. The experience will also enhance the, the value of your degree, and hopefully it will make you a much better lifelong learner. Academically, a study abroad program will not necessarily be better than your program back here at home at, uh, at uh, Albany State University, but it will certainly be different. It will be an enhancement of, of the situation for our students. Students who have participated showed that they learned an awful lot and they had a very amazing experience. I encourage all students to take advantage of opportunities to, to study abroad and thus bring a very special global perspective to bear on your studies and, the, and at the same time enhance your career options, whether you want to study domestically and work domestically, or where do you want to do more work internationally. Hopefully the younger students in our presence today will take advantage even long before you get to college to move beyond our borders. Look beyond the immediate boundaries and you will find a world of opportunities. Maybe this is not a flat world now, but maybe a smaller one. New technology has made this opportunity to learn about other companies, other countries, and other opportunities around the world. And the ASU global program will make it even more possible. I'm looking forward to hearing about your experiences and looking forward to having our students who went abroad tell you how much they enjoyed and how much they learned from this study abroad experience. Thank you very much.
I will start by saying that I am someone who has benefited from study abroad. My whole education is embodied with study abroad and the benefits still rolls on. I had my first degree here in the US. I came over to the US at the age of 20 and had my first degree. And that was the beginning of my study abroad. Anytime you travel outside your own comfort zone, outside from your family, your friends, and go to a foreign country to study and earn some credit hours and earn a degree, an associate degree, you are studying abroad. Study abroad is something, an experience, an educational experience that has been, that we have continued to stress over this 21st century. Anybody that has gone through academics, have gotten a degree, or have gone through all educational process without having an outside experience, is really missing a lot. Through study abroad, you expand your horizons. You acquire experiences, global competencies that will help you to survive in life. So study abroad is some, an experience, an educational experience that we continuously ask our students to acquire before they graduate. So what exactly do, you, do we mean? It simply means taking your regular academic classes, but outside of your regular normal school environment. So does it mean traveling for fun? Does it mean taking a vacation? They are not synonymous. So traveling abroad for study doesn't mean just going for vacation. It means much more than that. Um, it is not a sightseeing relaxation trip. It involves studies. It involves reading. It involves listening. It involves effectively observing writing, lots of note taking, comparing notes with peers, meeting foreign uh, peers, making friends with foreign peers, uh, dialoguing with them, talking and understanding them. It, may, it also involves taking quizzes outside of your school, normal school campus, taking exams and passing those exams and coming down back home with credits. So some people think that when you study abroad, it simply means you go over there and have fun and go to the beach and relax. So they get antagonistic when you give them assignments and they get worried. So it means much more than just traveling outside to go and have fun. But it also involves enjoying by the beach side, because after you've done a great day job, we have beaches. For example, this summer in China, we, at, we were at Xiamen University. At Xiamen University is a campus by the beach side. So students, after studying very hard, they go to the beach side, they relax, and they, you know, they have fun. But they still come back to do their assignments. Um, so, study abroad provides opportunity to acquire academic knowledge. It helps us to acquire social, cultural, and global skills so that students gain the intercultural competence necessary for survival in any country outside of theirs. You never can tell where you'll find yourself. You may be an ambassador tomorrow, and that is what we are encouraging you all to aim at doing. You don't have to just settle for a an internal job here on, in the US. You can get an outside job as, uh, as an ambassador. We need a lot of minorities up there, and everybody should avail themselves of, of that opportunity. You cannot, of course, aspire to jo those jobs if you've not studied abroad, if you've not had outside ex experience. So we are encouraging you to study abroad, and that is why we are even inviting the middle schools so that they'll begin early to know what study abroad is all about, to aspire and plan on studying abroad. Um, so uh, we, when you study abroad, you improve your attitudes towards people that are different from you. You no longer up complain of listening to people who have accent or speak differently from you. You no longer frown at them because you now understand that everybody must not speak like you. 
that everybody that we have, thousands of people, we have billions of people in the world, and that the population is even greater than you that speak English. And so you begin to tolerate, you begin to appreciate. You begin to appreciate that the fact that somebody has a different language but has taken time to learn English and now communicates with you in English. And so you begin also to make effort to speak other languages. Right now we want, we want as many US students as possible to learn other languages. A language like Chinese spoken by 1.3 billion plus people. We are only 300 and something million population. That is quite small. The only strategy we have in order to meet up and compete a strategy of communication, being able to communicate with them, understanding them, speaking their language, dialoguing, and doing diplomatic work with them. You cannot do diplomatic work with people if you cannot understand them. Understanding people makes them feel happy. They make, it makes them feel accepted. So we urge the younger ones who are growing up to begin to learn, to think about studying abroad, to think about learning other languages and communicating with people. When you communicate with people, they feel accepted. So we urge people to go ahead and do that. So once you begin to communicate and you begin to accept other cultures, your tolerance level is increased. You have more patience. You are more accepting of other people. You do not continuously criticize and criticize and criticize. You now know that we are all individuals entitled to our own cultures and should open up and accept other cultures. So this is what study abroad gives you and provides to you. Um, so at ASU, we have all kinds of study abroad that we encourage students to uh, embark on. Uh, the University System of Georgia um, has different kinds of study abroad. We have what we call the island program. Island programs just simply means that you do the same academic program that we do here, that just like we did in China, but we have our faculty members go with us to a, another university. We are housed there, and we teach our regular classes. That's an island. It simply means you're moving. You're moving your, your environment. And as you're learning your academic, pro, your, your regular courses, you're also learning culture. You're learning languages. You're learning to acquire new culture by traveling around, touring the country, interacting and mixing up and making friends with people from other countries. We have hybrid programs that combine this island program with going abroad and enrolling in an institution. Ours could also be described as such because while in, in China, we learned Chinese language. And I'm sure some of our students here will be able to give you some, you know, speak some of those to you so that you understand that they learned something while they were there. They were getting up at 8 a.m. every morning. It was difficult. They were getting up at 8 a.m. to take their Chinese language classes. They also took classes in Chinese uh, culture and to Kung Fu and all those. These are programs that were designed by the Sherman University. So you might de define our own program as a hybrid because we went there as an island program, but we also took classes with the Chinese uh, professors. So um, we have, uh, here at ASU, we make available a lot of opportunities for you to experience several programs. At present, you can study abroad with us you can do uh, in China for four weeks. You can go to Costa Rica for four weeks, Britain for four weeks, France for four weeks, Germany for four weeks, Spain for four weeks, Russia for four weeks, Ireland for four weeks. And recently we have a new program that you spend two weeks in, two weeks in Scotland. And we have programs in, uh, in Trinidad and Tobago for four weeks and, another and other countries, depending on what your choice is. Even if you decide that you want to go to other countries that are not listed here, we can plan and arrange for you to have that experience. Increasingly, too, we are also uh, intending to embody internships. For our Chinese uh, program, we have uh, students who also took, uh, did some internship uh, uh, program while, while they are in China. So just uh, how do you pay for study abroad? Just like you pay for your fees. Nothing different. Some people are scared. They say, well, it's going to cost you know, a lot of money. So 
we, we probably might not be able to do that. But you do that, you use your financial aid, you use scholarships. We have, presently we have the Gilman Scholarship that two of our students benefited from, and they are going to talk about it. Um, so the Gilman will award you $4,000 to $8,000. And that will pay for everything, including for your tours and everything. All you need to do is to start early, write your proposal, and we'll help to read your proposal, edit, and sub help you submit it. And that's exactly what the two students that got it did. Even though they started at the last minute, but they still got the scholarship. These scholarship boards are looking forward to receiving proposals from minority students. We don't have minority students applying, and they are eager, always asking us to submit proposals from minority students. So we are encouraging you um, to put in your proposal early, and we'll help to um, get this submitted. So apart from these means of uh, funding yourself, you can also start early to seek for sponsors. We have a student here also who simply went with a letter that, a template that we designed. And we give you as many copies as possible and you give it to as many people, churches, and he was able to raise all his money just from, you know, giving it out. So if you start now and you want to go, you might even be surprised you raise much more than you even want, will uh, use up. So we urge you to please register for st summer 2013 study abroad and we hope that this presentation, the presentation we we'll have today, will, will um, urge you to join in, in the race for study abroad. So what do you need? Get your passport, travel to a foreign country, study abroad, learn new cultures and languages, and become a global citizen. Thank you. Dr. Osakwe hinted at it's not all rainbows and sunshine all the time. Um, when I, you know, signed up to teach in China, I really had some preconceived notions. I had some stereotypical ideas about what to expect. Um, where do I point this at? Okay, next slide. Um, we'll do it like that. <laughs> um, anyway, my first preconceived notion on the next slide, which will hopefully, there we go, was that China was this huge modern, you know, society, can't wait to hurtle into the 22nd century, skyscrapers, wireless internet everywhere. And as you can see from the pictures, we had some of that. You know, there was. But then, as you can see, um, I had a second idea of what China would be like in my uh, next slide, the notion of Mulan. Are we all familiar with the Disney movie Mulan? If not, yes, you are good. You know, beautiful courtyards. Back one slide, Maggie. Um, beautiful courtyards and um, buildings with pointy roofs and you know, buildings influenced by like France and Spain that, you know, colonized parts of China for a while. I thought maybe we're going to live there. What was it really like? Well, if you look at the next slide. When we went to Shaman, what we saw was lots and lots of people. Next slide, Maggie. See, this will work out. Is lots and lots of people um, on buses, trains, planes, streets. There's people everywhere. You have no idea. Also, if you go to Shaman, you'll be walking up and down lots of stairs. I brought one pair of heels like this. I don't think they left my suitcase once. You just, I mean, every single student will probably agree. We did lots of walking. And also, the buildings, there were some pretty buildings, but the building we lived in was the building up there, which looked more like it belonged behind the Iron Curtain in Czechoslovakia or Hungary or something like that. Um, what was it like to live there? Um, on the next slide... Um, you'll see um, a picture of my accommodations. Maggie, I don't know if you can hear me. There we go. Um, we stayed in a dorm in a building whose name I'm going to mispronounce. It's Chai Ching J, which is, I'm totally mispronouncing this. It's for the foreign students. Um, I had a room to myself. Most of our students shared a room. As you can see, it's very much like a U.S. dorm. You know, you have a desk, a bed, stairwell. Do you notice one difference, though? Yes, the toilet, exactly. I was lucky. I had a normal toilet. The students did not. Every single public toilet in China was like that. And they didn't have toilet paper. So you brought, you you brought your own, or I don't know what you did. 
But that, that definitely took some getting used to, you know, balancing wise and everything. Um, next slide shows another issue that I had, um, laundry. You know, you stay there for a month. Obviously, you can't bring a month's worth of clothes, so you do laundry. Now, here in America, if you go to school here, you have washers and dryers, right? They might cost you a quarter, but, you know, an hour later, you got clean clothes. Well, in China, they have washers. You see the laundry room up there? It's a little, little iffy looking, but they have washers. They don't have dryers. And it's like Albany in August, but about 100% humidity. You also don't have central air conditioning in China. You have window units. So in case you looked at my room and you're going, man, that Dr. Rose mom had a lot of clothes laying about her room. She's a slob. No, that was stuff I was trying to dry. See, most Chinese people, as you can see on this picture on the bottom there, beautiful buildings, and there's clothes hanging everywhere because that's how you dry them. So your pants, your shirt, your underwear, your bras, for everyone to see. Well, I didn't quite like that, but you know, what are you going to do? So at the end of the day, I took myself to our communal balcony, which, by the way, was also used to clean the mop that they used for uh, cleaning our floors, and I got the five-foot pole, put my little hangers on the pole, and, you know, like a circus act, hung my laundry up to dry. It worked great, but it took some getting used to. Um, I put in a picture of the bathroom just to show you all. That was our bathroom. That was it, people. No tub, handheld shower, you know. It took some adjusting. I was thrilled to have a shower, but I was really happy to be home, too. Your next question might be, what do we eat? Um, next slide shows that on campus, there's a lot of places you can eat. Um, we had a little store in our building, sold everything from toilet paper to uh, clothespins, you know, for those lines, to food, to bread, to soda, run by a lovely lady that we called Ai Yi, which means auntie, although I actually called her Yi Yi, which means older sister. Um, the building on the bottom there is one of the cafeteria on campus, down the stairs, down three flights of stairs. That's where I would go to get my breakfast. Um, and cafeterias here, if you've ever been to a cafeteria at school, you know, you get in line and you stand in line and you wait. Not in China. You just kind of rush to the counter and you push the plate at the lady and you hope that she notices you and you get fed. Um, a lot of the questions I got was, um, can you eat anywhere else? Well, on the next slide you'll see, um, you can. We had, obviously, outside campus, there was KFC, Burger King, McDonald's, for which I think our students were very grateful. But we also had street vendors. Um, they would, you know, cook your food for you on the street. You could buy pineapple, fruit. It was really tasty. On the next slide, you'll see that um, we also had a grocery store right there where um, I discovered Chinese people really like Jell-O. They had lots and lots of Jell-O. They would sell fresh fish. As you can see, there's octopus on discount on the right. Um, herbs, um, uh, you know, all kinds of herbs. It was really amazing. Another question I get a lot is, Dr. Rose, mom, did you get sick? Did you have like a lot of bad experiences? I didn't, but um, on the next slide you'll see, I had some of the best food ever in China. Seriously, awesome. I forgot what all these were called, Dr. Joe. I am so sorry. But on the left was something bamboo. It was really good. Next slide, you'll see some of the stranger experiences. I don't have a picture of the fried pork blood that we got served that only Dr. Joe had the courage to eat. But on the right, there is a fish that you're supposed to like eat whole. And on the left, that was our breakfast on our first day when we didn't quite know how the cafeteria worked. It's um, sort of like a noodle that's stuffed with meat and served on a bed of twigs. You're not supposed to eat the twigs, but it was definitely odd. Um, the next slide will show what your daily meals look like. Breakfast is on your left, lunch is on the bottom, and on the far right is dinner. Um, if you don't like rice, that might be problematic. If you can't eat with chopsticks, that might be problematic because they don't have silverware there. So you're either going to eat with chopsticks or you're going to go hungry. So I think everybody pretty much adapted, but it was really, really tasty. Um, as far as the campus, on the next slide you'll see gorgeous campus. I mean, this is where all my Mulan dreams came true. You know, beautiful buildings. Um, I mean, that pond up there was just a little area off the campus, gorgeous. Um, the next slide, you'll see that, um, very surprising, you know, we had suddenly, like straight out of some history book, a, a gentleman who cleans the street and bicycles around on a little cart, you know, with a, a, um, a broom made of twigs. 
graduates that looked like they came straight out of the United States, you know, with caps and gowns. And then for a country that is known for its tea, there were coffee shops like the one on the right everywhere. I've never had as much coffee as I've had in China. It was amazing. Um, but then also, on the next slide, again, there's that strange contradiction. We had guards everywhere around the campus. I'll talk about the bugs later. Um, you know, we had people with helmets and guns guarding our, our facilities. Um, on the right, we had a gorgeous gym. I mean, sorry, ASU, it could give you all a run for your money, except it didn't have AC. So, and yeah, those bugs. Um, I ha I'm sorry, people. I, I had to talk about that real quick. There were cicadas in trees that just lived there and flew around all day. And then at night, they would come into your building, mate, because it was mating season, die, because that's what they, what they would do. And then in the morning, you would get up, go to get your breakfast, and walk past about 50 dead bugs. So that was also my China experience. Um, obviously, we did some teaching. On the next slide, you'll see your typical Chinese classroom. Um, as you can see, we had, you know, that's our Chinese teacher over there. We had a PowerPoint, a projector, everything, but then also just blackboard that came from like the 1950s and beautiful tile on the floor and desks that I think my mother, you know, probably went to school in. It was really, again, that contradiction between old and new, you know, that you saw everywhere. Um, so in short, on, on your next slide, um, in short, Expect the unexpected. You know, in China, you expect a ton of tea, and what do you get? Coffee. You expect to know your schedule on the right. I don't know if you can see, but it changed every single day. You know, you expect high rises. You get a lake, a beautiful nature. You know, I mean, it's a gorgeous country. It is absolutely amazing, but be prepared for everything, and you will have the time of your life. Thank you. And we also did calligraphy. And I don't know if anyone has ever heard of calligraphy before, but it's an artistic, stylized, or elegant handwriting. And in short, it's just beautiful handwriting. And it takes much practice to try to master it, but once you get it, it's like art. Um, next, we did... No, go back. Okay. We did go on a couple of excursions. We went to Panda World, the Great Wall of China. As I said before, it's Jamin Daly. We visited some Hakka houses, Jamei, and the Tiananmen Square. Next. Okay, Panda World. Now, at, in Panda World, we were able to see some of the big pandas, but in the time that we went, most of the pandas were taking a nap. So, therefore, you see all the pandas looking almost dead, but they were just really sleeping. Um, Panda World is located in Fuzhou, China, and they really use this as a research center to study more about pandas. And pandas are actually being, well, they are extinct, really. Um, there's only a few of them left in the world. And most of them are housed right here in Panda World. Um, and the center also had other types of animals, um, some species that belong to bear, and numerous migratory birds and exhibitions of rare plants. Next. Um, the Great Wall of China, as you see our beautiful picture, um, we were able to see nice landscapes, beautiful mountaintops. The Great Wall of China can be visited at many places along the wall, where along its length of several thousand kilometers. Its condition ranges from excellent to ruined, and access from straightforward to quite difficult. Um, climbing this was very fun. I don't know how everyone else might have took it, but um, it was certainly an experience. And to be able to see that view, not only from a picture, but to actually see it is something different that you can't see anywhere else other than studying abroad. Next. The Jamin Daily. Now, the Jamin Daily is um, a newspaper production, and we got to 
look at the, well, we got to explore the newspaper museum, walk around, and in the middle, we actually got to see how the newspaper was put together. So right here is their tiles where they had to do by hand. So it took them a long time to make a newspaper back in the day. And we got to see how it changed from back then to now they have color copies. Next, the Hakka houses. Now these Hakka houses were built um, a while back and they were built for a defense mechanism um, to be able to, I guess, protect the families inside of the houses um, from armies so that they would be able to stay safe. The Hakka Wild Village is a large multifamily communal living structure that is designed to be easily defensible. This building style is unique to the Hakka people found in southern China. Wild villages are typically designed for defense pur purposes and consist of one entrance and no windows at the ground level. And we were not, that last picture, with the second picture, we were not able to go at the top of it, but one of our students, being real slick, managed to get up um, to the top of the house, and some of the Chinese people kind of yelled at her and told her to get away, and so it was real intense. But um, she didn't tell anyone but me, but <laughs> I'm not going to say who it was. Um, next, Jamei. This attraction is the hometown of Mr. Tan Kaki, a renowned educator and leader of overseas China. And this attraction, he, he was also buried on his own attraction. Um, the mo this is the most remarkable feature and is without, the doubt, without a doubt the Jamei Study Village founded by Mr. Tan Kaki in 1913 and is the only one in China. Next. And last but not least, the Tiananmen Square. Um, the Tiananmen Square had a situation happen in 1989 where protesters were pretty much speaking against the government. The Chinese government is really strict over there in China. They try to keep a control over everything, all information. So therefore, these protesters were speaking against the government. And what they did at this attraction, um, they military came with big, I guess, Tonka trucks and killed all the protesters at this attraction. This attraction is very um, popular. Everyone knows about it. Um, and it's widely known as the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Um, and it's kind of ironic that we're happy at this attraction, but I guess it just be like that. Um, all right, so that's all the time that I have for today. Um, just like the last presenter, I'm going to teach you all how to say hello. And it's not bonjour, it's bonjour. 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 So it needs to come from your throat, like the inside of your throat. You really have to mean it with your heart and your soul. That's how they taught me how to say it. So um, when I first landed, of course, I'm like, oh, I know how to say hello. Bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. And they're like, no, 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 American, you say bonjour. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, OK, sorry. So I learned how to say bonjour my first day um, in Paris, France. Um, I'm Sonique O'Neill. I'm a 23-year-old graduating senior, originally from Los Angeles, California. And I had the awesome experience of going to Paris, France this summer. Um, these are a couple of pictures of me at the Eiffel Tower. And I'll explain that as I go on in the presentation. Next slide. Can you all hear me on this mic? Is it working? OK. Next slide. 
All right, so um, take off. I left on June 28th this past summer. Um, I went from Atlanta, Georgia to Frankfurt, Germany, and that was about a 10 hour trip. Um, I'm originally from Los Angeles, California, so I travel all the time by air. And I'm thinking, oh, this is a piece of cake. It's nothing, I do this all the time. Well, I was very wrong. Um, I flew internationally. Um, I flew La, La Funza. And um, the 10 hour flight, it wasn't that it was long, it just was kind of boring, I guess. Um, you know how flights can be. Um, so we had a layover in Frankfurt, Germany, and it was for two hours. The airport in Germany was like a mall, guys. It was so cool. It was just like Wi-Fi everywhere. They had stations where you could charge your iPad and your iPhone, things of that such. Um, they had great um, different uh, restaurants in the food court. So since, you know, everybody is from different um, cultures and different countries, they had a Chinese restaurant, they had a Japanese restaurant, they had an American restaurant. So they had all these different restaurants where you could try different samples throughout the food court, as well as a Germany restaurant. So um, we were there for about two hours. We took pictures, had fun, things of that such. Um, once we left Frankfurt, we went to Paris, which was about um, one and a half hours, almost two hours. Next slide. Once we landed, like I said, I was American, and I said, bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. And they said, oh, no, no, bonjour, bonjour. So um, once they greet you with bonjour, they kiss you on each cheek, and they do it very bougie. It's not like, you know what I mean? So um, that was also very different for me, just because we see it in Western culture on TV all the time, but experiencing it was a whole different ball game. Um, the housing, we stayed in a hostel. Um, in Western culture, we think that a hostel is something run down where there's not technology or it's not up to date, it's not modern. Well, our hostel, which was called the FIAP, or as you would say in French, Le FIAP, and um, it was very welcoming. We had Wi-Fi, there was um, a mini, cafe, kind of like a Starbucks feel, where they had couches, things of that such. And um, the housing that we stayed in um, had different other groups from different countries as well. So we weren't the only Americans. There were other Americans, people from other countries and cultures that didn't speak English. So it was great interacting with other cultures. Um, for lunch, we had baguettes and wine. Um, it's not, wine is not um, a liquor overseas in France, it's kind of just a beverage, like how we drink water, they drink wine. So um, baguettes is basically bread. They serve it with, um, sometimes you can get parsley, you can get olive oil, sometimes you can get butter, depending on what part of Paris you're in. Um, and when I say the sidewalks transfer, transform to model runways, um, everybody over there is just fashionistas. Everybody is dressed to the T and um, they're on a, a mission, everybody's going somewhere, they look fabulous, even crossing the streets. Next slide. The first day um, after we landed, of course we're on a six hour time difference, so when you all are going to sleep, we are getting our day started. So as you know, we're not adjusted to time. This is our first day. And um, it was very eventful. The first time, uh, the first trip we took was to convert our money. I had um, $500 in US dollars. I got about 363 euros. That's how much the dollar is really losing the battle um, when you look at it from a world perspective. So um, I'm thinking, oh, I get $500, 500 euros. No, it doesn't work like that. So um, that was interesting. The, um, the next trip that we took was to the Louvre. Um, has anybody heard of the Louvre? Le Louvre is what they call it. Um, the Louvre is a huge museum of ancient art, um, historic art, modern art. There's different kind of exhibitions in the Louvre. Um, when we were there, has anybody heard of the rapper called Nas? He was there. Um, I didn't get to see Kanye West, but he was at the Louvre as well. So they had a lot of uh, different parts of the Louvre blocked off just because celebrities were there enjoying their time. Um, this is where the original Mona Lisa is held. Has anybody heard of the Mona Lisa? 
that's where the Mona Lisa is held. So I was really excited to see the Mona Lisa and um, they kind of left it to the end of our trip because they knew we were so excited to see it. I probably got from here to the young man in the red shirt. That's the closest I got to the Mona Lisa. It's very, very protected. They have a bulletproof glass around the painting. Um, it's very small. I was thinking of this huge colossal and the Mona Lisa is very, very small. It's very tiny and very protected. Um, the next trip that we took is the Arc de Triomphe. And that is a picture of the Arc de Triomphe. It's on the same street as a street called Champs-Élysées. And um, Champs-Élysées is a huge avenue and it's filled with shops. I mean, shops and shops and shops. H&M, Louis Vuitton, Fendi. Gucci, Prada, all the labels you can think of. It was absolutely heaven. Um, and my last point that I keep wanna, uh, I keep wanna say over and over again, the jet, I mean the jet lag, it was just terrible. It was horrible, ladies. I was just trying to cope with the culture, but still, you know, get used to the time. Next slide. Um, the second day we got introduced to our classes, our professors and um, the criteria that we'll be covering. So I had the luxury of taking um, Sociology of Photography and French One. Sociology of Photography, um, we basically went out into the field a lot. We had our cameras. We were able to take pictures of different things around Paris, which was really fun. French, um, our first day of class, like I was um, telling some of our professors earlier, our first day of class, we had to meet him at a restaurant restaurant. And um, obviously we're in France, so the addresses are in France, French. And um, this is our second day. I mean, I don't know how to get around town. So we had to, you know, literally stop pedestrians like, excuse me, could you tell us how to get to this address? Some of them do not speak English. Um, so eventually we get to the restaurant and we had to order our food in French. It was really, really fun. Um, and that was our first day. Next slide. So the French culture, um, in the corner right here, I don't know if you all can see it, that is called a uh, croque madame. Can you say it? Croque madame. They have something called a croque madame and a croque monsieur. I had a croque madame my, as my uh, second meal, I guess, after the baguettes and wine. And it's basically um, a piece of toast with shredded cheese and an egg just an egg. And I'm just like, and as you all can see, I'm a very small girl, but I eat a lot. A lot of people know that smaller people eat a lot of food. Um, <laughs> so this is my first real meal that I'm ordering. And um, I just ordered something. I made a commitment to myself that when I went overseas, I was not going to eat any American food just because you want to grow and you want to get out of your comfort zone. So that was the first meal I had. Um, it honestly tasted very good. I just wanted more of it. So uh, that was kind of a culture shock. Um, actually, I, um, the restaurant that we went to, I asked for water they did not have water, um, they had wine. And um, some of you all in the crowd are a little young, but when you are drinking alcohol, you wanna make sure that you have food in your system. So obviously this toast with shredded cheese and an egg is not gonna suffice of my appetite with me drinking alcohol. So um, it was definitely a culture shock. It was something to get used to, um, but you know. That's what happens when you travel overseas. Um, the language, I already talked about how they corrected me on simple things like bonjour, um, to say thank you is merci. It's not merci, it's merci. Mer Mer it's kind of like you're having, you know, one of those Louis in the back of your throat when you're sick and you're like, Ugh. it's like that. Merci, bonjour. I love it. Um, the fashion and the shopping, as you all can see, obviously I'm in the fashion. So um, I noticed it right away. And um, ladies would have these you know, hats and everybody would have on high heels with their hosiery and their big bags and their little Yorkie poos and things like that. All the men were dressed in suits. They had ties, just very sophisticated. And that's just their culture. That's their everyday life. Um, the Metro, um, which is also known as the subway here in America, is a picture of it right here. That metro station is actually right across from the Louvre. You can take the metro to the Louvre. Um, the metro system is not like you think 
of New York or Chicago or things of that such is actually very nice and is actually um, the best way to get around. Paris is very expensive and the gas is very expensive. The traffic is terrible. Um, you think New York is bad or LA is bad, Paris is worse. So a lot of people take the metro. Um, the attitude of the French people, um, I kind of think that in, here in America we think that French people are all snobby and they're stuck up and they have their nose in the air. And honestly, Honestly, if you're nice to them, they're nice to you. And if you try to learn their language, they'll help you with the language as long as you're showing um, that you're trying. Um, the family life, I wanted to speak about something really quick. Um, I noticed that they would have, uh, families will be walking down the street or something like that, shopping or whatever they're doing, and their toddlers will be just walking on their own. It's not like they will be holding their hands like, come on, you know, la la la, like here in America. And um, the reason is because they treat their children as as if they're adults. They want them to know this is the real world. If something happens to me, I want you to be able to survive, basically. So their children are very respectful. They're very um, polite. They have the best manners. And um, I noticed it right off the bat just because, you know, American children are a little bit pacified and, you know, we kind of hug on to our mothers and our fathers. Um, older and younger, but they are, you know, three years old, four years old, walking by themselves down the street. I mean, their mother may be in a store or they might be walking on their own trail, but they'll be just tagging along. Next slide. So um, this is um, a picture of the Eiffel Tower in the corner. And I was actually there on Bastille Day. Bastille Day is July 14th. And that is their Independence Day. That's their July 4th. So I was very fortunate to being there. They had fireworks. Um, Kim Kardashian was there. Oh, it was awesome. Um, this is also a picture right here of a nightclub. They party hard in Paris. And they think that we're really snobby um, here in America. Um, they really, I mean, they party Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Saturday. I mean, they party every day. And I'm like, I have to go to class, guys. It's 5 a.m. Like, I need to catch the metro, go back home. Um, but they, um, I feel like they live life over in France. And here, we're kind of taught that we need to get education, and then we need to work so we can have a good life and leave it for our kids and pass away and die. Like, that's not what they live for over there. I mean, they live over there. They eat, they drink, they shop, they go to concerts, the museums, things of that such. Um, oh, I just wanted to talk about vacation. So I went to um, Paris in June, but it was the end of June. I came back at the beginning of August. So I was there for the entire month of July. They called that month vacation. So, um, Vacation for them is not about going to the beach, like how we go down to Florida and we, you know, duh, that's not vacation for them. Vacation is shopping. It's all about fashion. So um, you know how you can go to Forever 21 or you go to Marshalls or wherever you shop at and they'll be having 25% off, 10% off, things of that such. They don't have that overseas. They only have one month of sales. So it starts from July 1st to July 31st and everybody goes shopping. I mean... Men, women, kids, the dogs, everybody goes shopping. So it's total chaos over in, um, in Paris during the month of July. Next slide. Okay, so these are some of the class field trips. Um, I know we're limited on time, so I can't go through every single one. But um, the Moulin Rouge. Um, when I went to the Moulin Rouge, I asked them, did they know who Patti LaBelle was? And they didn't know who Patti LaBelle was. And I thought that was amazing, just because, I mean, when we hear Moulin Rouge, we think of Patti. They don't. Um, I went to the Eiffel Tower. I had the luxury of climbing the Eiffel Tower. My feet, I think I left them on the top of the Eiffel Tower, actually, just because of so much walking. The Champs-Élysées, I talked about that. Claude Monet Gardens, he's a famous um, artist. He is the founder of Impressionism Art. If you want to look him up, you can. Van Gogh's Museum, everybody knows about Van Gogh, hopefully. Um, the Central of Pompidou, it is a modern art museum. The King Louis and Marie Antoinette, which is called Versailles, very, very peaceful. Um, Jervin is a wax museum. The Red Light District is where they sell women and um, women uh, prostitute, things of that such. Um, the Sacre Basilica is a huge cathedral. The Pope has been there. Everybody goes there when they go to Paris. Next slide. 
So these are just some of the pictures. Um, the orange and red is the Moulin Rouge Avenue, the Champs Elysees. The middle, um, with all the grass, that's Versailles. So peaceful. Um, the greenery is Claude Monet Gardens, and the little zigzag. That's actually an escalator up the center of Pompidou. Next slide. So, um, although I went to Paris, I had some excursions, and I was afforded the opportunity to go to Barcelona and Amsterdam. They were awesome, amazing. I'm short on time. So, oh, okay. So, um, next slide. I went to Amsterdam. Next slide. I love art. Next slide. <laughs> Um, I went to the Marc Jacobs Louis Vuitton exhibition. It was amazing. I got invited. I spoke French. I drank wine. I took pictures. It was great. I went to Togo with um, 10 American cadets, and it was just too great. Um, I had a chance to work with these cadets, and I'm, I was hoping that I'll get some of our cadets here to see all the chances they have to travel outside. All the 10 had everything paid for. I went with 10 plus one army captain and myself. We traveled from Louisville, no, Fort Knox to Louisville, to Atlanta, Paris, Lomé, and back. Everything paid for. So if you are here and you don't use that chance, please think about it. You don't have to do anything. The only thing you have to do is you have to go through the course. And this course uh, is MLS 2.2200. And it's run by North Georgia College. It's um, cross-cultural communication. And our job was to do the following, to promote English language through the use of American cultural topics introduced through open discussion and classroom work, uh, to use English language practically during afternoon uh, cl classroom interaction and outdoor activities to develop leadership and team building skills, both within and outside the classroom, to raise cross-cultural awareness and tolerance of cultural differences, and finally, to establish individual relationships ac across cultural boundaries. And that's exactly what we did. I had cadets um, from, there we go, the lady right here is from Maine. The next one is from Virginia. Next is from Ohio. Next from Ohio. Stephanie is the next lady from Wisconsin. The next one is from Iowa. And then that is my lady from Hawaii. She swam like a fish. Uh, and then, and then uh, the guy, the, the, one, the one down here was the PR person. He did an excellent job picking all the pictures. Trust me, I had a bag full of pictures, about 500 shots, uh, videos, and all that. What you're going to see here is just a tiny bit like this. Everything in my bag is full of pictures from Togo. Now, one thing I had, uh, I learned from my cadets was that they felt they were going into some kind of uh, a bush or world. They were going to sleep on trees and all that. Um, we went through uh, Paris. We saw all the nice things in Paris. Then we went down to Lomé. When we got down in Lomé, one, one asked me, OK, where, where is the airport? The airport is right here. And then he said, Dr. Tony, it looks like uh, uh, a Greyhound station. <laughs> oh my goodness, shut up. <laughs> it's not a Greyhound station, but it's OK. But those are the things they were thinking about. They were surprised that they had all the good things that to police our forces could, could give us. We had an escort in front of us with a BMW uh, motorcycle. He led us right from Lomé to Kara. That was the, uh, the president's hometown. So there are two big cities in Togo. Lomé in the south, close to the sea, and then Kara in the north. That's about 230 miles up north. The guy in the, on the motorcycle led us cookie, 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 up there. <laughs> this is the first time in my life I've, I've been treated like, like, like a president. We had uh, we have four police officers, two, and uh, then three army officers. One of them was a, a, a medical officer. 
So whatever we had to do, if any, we had any problem, we had people around us. So we, we went there. Please, let's have next slide, please. We have so many slides. Just run them. Just hit them. Next slide, please. Right. This Fort Knox, this is where it all started. We have to go through pre-deployment stuff. Um, cadets go through a whole lot of uh, training. And then uh, we stayed in that big hotel right there. Next, please. That's me. And this is Captain Bracci. Uh, she was uh, in charge of the cadets. I did the instruction part, and she was in charge of all the logistics. Next, please. And for the first time, I learned how to bow. I didn't even know how to bow. So back in Fort Knox, they took us out there to one of the bowling centers in Fort Knox, and then we started bowling. Right, next, please. And this is Lomi. When we got down, the next day, we were driven around, we went to the main, uh, the Bank of uh, Togo, and we, we exchanged money. And then, next place. Now, I took this because it's very, very important. And for our, for our school here, for our college, we need to know this. This was one of the old piers where um, the our colonizers, the slave masters, this is where they pick slaves, and then they'll ship them right into the sea right there and then the ships will be out there. It's still standing in Lomi. Now, this thing is just 60 miles uh, to the west of uh, Benin, where most slaves were bought and shipped over to, to, the, uh, to the other world. So please, this was very, very important for me. Next, please. Now, luckily, when we're coming out from that beach, someone was getting married, so we got that. Just married, to release that. We have horses, nice cars, and that's the road going down to Benin and Nigeria. Right there, goes right here. Next place. When we got to Kara in the north, the first person we had to see was this woman. She is the chief for the whole, um, they have what you call cantons. And the canton will be like um, uh, counties, right. And then the canton, this the main chief. She has about 16 sub chiefs that she deals with. So we have to see her first, else we'll be thrown out. Next place. Then we went to the military establishments. Togo has Lomi and Kara. All the military establishments are up north because uh, President Yasime Yasigbe Yadama came from the north, and everything's security had to be in the north. So this was the first place we got the, this, uh, the para, paratroopers uh, battalion, and the guy there was the colonel in charge. Next place. Then we had to see the regional governor. He, the guy in the black, he is a retired military officer, but he is the governor. And the next guy there was the guy in charge of the military, uh, the military school where we worked at. Next, please. Luckily for us, we had the US ambassador come to visit us. That's, that's him right there, and that's his wife. And the, his wife is from Rwanda. He has a Rwandan wife. Next, please. Then uh, we had, I had to chat with the three gentlemen there were the, the pilots who flew the ambassador to Kara, not even Lomi. He flew straight from Ghana to Kara. Um, Commander Coons and then Lieutenant Colonel Bati on the other side. Next, please. We had a chance to go out. This was um, a waterfall like 20 miles down in Kara. We went up around 1,000 feet, and that was it. And here, I nearly had a heartbreak, a heart attack. One of the, one of the students, standing right there and nearly fell over. Well, so I have to be very careful. Next, please. And back here, we, from the top, we came down to where the splash, the whole, the, the waterfall ended. And we were asked not to, to swim in it. Some of the cadets wanted to swim in it. So I had to uh, do some, uh, push a few people around. Okay, please go ahead. Let's see some of the slides. We don't have much time. Next, please. 
Now, you, you would think that we're in a village, but it was so morning. Um, this is uh, one of the outlets out there, an outdoor place where we could eat whatever we wanted. And some of my cadets bought um, African attire. And you can see, this, this was a night that we had uh, Miss Togo be picked. And from, uh, from our villages, we came to, uh, from, to Kara. And then from here, we went into uh, one of the big centers like here, where they had a, a pageant. And they danced all over the place. So please, let's see what some of the things we had. Next slide, please. That's the, that's the competition. Uh, Miss Togo and our cadets were, I mean, outstanding. They just couldn't think about that. That we were in the village and we were in the city at the same time. And we were dancing the same thing, rapping, doing all the things you do right here. Yeah. Next. Uh, these were the ladies. I have the video, but we can show that. Let's move on. Next, please. And this is the lady who won it. Okay, next please. And uh, we had to teach the cadets. These were the Togolese cadets. All right, and that, that's Captain Bratty right there. The, um, the American cadets taught them how to play fo American football, how to swim, how to play basketball, everything. So next thing. They had to do the old drills in the morning with the Togolese cadets. And then next please. And that's it. Somebody mixed the missed the flight right there. They were playing football. Now, one thing I like about them is you put them just like a day, and the next morning they were playing. That's it. Next, please. They taught them how to swim as well. And next. There we go. Do it. Next. Uh huh. And two days before we left Lome, I have to take them to the beach for them to swim. And that is um, Kenneth Way, Way Birds from Hawaii. She got into the sea like a dolphin. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> before I could say anything, she was like one mile away. So I had to get some Togolese guys to go bring her back. But she loved it. She loved the water. So that's it. Uh, next, please. Uh, this was the time I told them to go. Dr. Tony, can we go? No. Can we go? And then when I say yes, we just jump right in there. We're going for the waves. Uh, next, please. And this was the um, this was in Kara. We had uh, this American community out there in Kara. Uh, the guy here in the blue is a, me a medical doctor, and there are others who are um, religious people, and we met them. Next, please. This one here is the, pre the uh, former president's house. It's like a huge house. One mile here, one mile there, and about two miles on that side. Huge. And it's all covered with walls. Nobody can go inside, but you have to go inside. And we saw exactly what he had, where he died, and all that. And they wouldn't let us take any picture apart from this one. Next, please. One thing I saw with Togolese is that they drink a lot. So there are two, uh, two breweries, one in Lomi, the big one in Lomi, and there's another one in Kara. And this was the, uh, the, uh, the brewery in Kara. They, they had everything, beer. But one good thing was that the students will not be allowed to drink anything, no alcohol at all. But one thing they did was they, they ate bats, B-A-T. They ate roasted bats. That's fine. Next, please. Now, you can see Kara right there, but the, the cadets had to climb a mountain. The poor boy, I mean, I couldn't go, but we went up the hill. Any cadet, any American officer will have to go through the training, and then he climbs that mountain with a stone on his head before you get your, 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 your rank. Next, please quickly, and that is it, right there. You have to carry the block, and then that black thing right there, you have to place your, your block on top of it before you get your, your colors, whatever it is. 
So next, please. We have to climb it right there. Next. And once we climb it, that is the, uh, the village right there in the valley. Next, please. We'll talk of the, uh, we'll talk of it. And next. And our cadets have to take pictures right on top. Next. We have to go to church. And we went, we went right into the village, met some of the villages. Finally, we had uh, uh, some kind of award ceremony. And I had my honorary uh, military award. Uh, so that's about it. Thank you very, very much. This is my first study abroad trip. Uh, I've traveled to China. Um, the reason I decided to study abroad was to, I say, grow as a person just a little bit. Um, I've traveled before. I've traveled to Central and Southern America, but it's always been like for a vacation and with my parents. This is my first, say, independent trip, you know, quote unquote, without my parents. Um, so it was uh, time for me to grow up, I guess. Um, next slide, please. Uh, like uh, Danielle said earlier before, we stayed at Jamin University. We took a couple of courses. Uh, we took uh, language, paper cutting, calligraphy, and kung fu. Uh, my favorite of them all was actually paper cutting. Um, you would think, you know, you know, cutting paper would be, you know, such an easy task, but it can get so complicated. And with the designs and the detail it comes with cutting the paper, it is. Uh, it can't get difficult. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some of the things uh, things we did. Uh, in the middle, that's Robin. She uh, actually that's a monkey she's holding. Uh, to the far uh, right, that is a leaf, and this green one is actually a, a fish. And that was the most difficult of all. The eyes are the hardest because um, you you have to make very small incisions to actually get the eyes right. Next slide, please. Uh, this is us actually um, doing kung fu class. I don't know if you could play the video. Uh, they can't play the video. It's about a 30 second video. Um, with kung fu, it's not, uh, it's about flow, your inner chi or, what, or whatnot. Um, you can, um, Uh, it's all about the flow. It's all one motion, to be honest. Um, is a you have to have what they call like inner peace, and you have to clear your mind to be able to do your kung fu. Next slide, please. Uh, we went on several several excursions. Um, my favorite of all of them was the Great Wall of China. We uh, visited the Hakka houses, like Daniel mentioned before. Panda World, which was pretty fun. The 10,000 Boulder Mountain, um, it was the highest mountain I've ever been on. It's Stone Mountain times 10. Uh, the Port of Shaman was pretty interesting because the Port of Shaman is one of the main ports in the world. Uh, all ports, all imports and exports for China go through the Port of Shaman. It was pretty uh, cool because we met the uh, general manager, the president of Shaman, uh, and we also visited Tiananmen Square. Next slide, please. This is us uh, at the, on the one side of the Great Wall of China. You can just look in the background and see how high we are in the epic scope. If you can look real close, you can see that the wall is just continually going and going and going, and it doesn't stop. Next slide. This picture itself is, uh, it sums up my trip. It's like my epic moment, like this is, uh, me on top of the world, that's how I felt at the moment um, as I gaze off into the looking real cool or whatnot, looking off into the, uh, into the sky with the background. It's like the depth of this uh, picture, uh, it'll be a, something I'll never forget. Next shot. This is the Hawker House, like Danielle mentioned before. It's a big uh, circle, um, you know, protecting the families from raiders or whatnot. They actually. The first two floors don't have windows so that no one can actually get in, but the top uh, three floors have windows. Um, they say it looks like a flower. I can't see it, but they say that's what makes it so beautiful. Next slide.
this is actually the panda itself. Uh, panda World, it was pretty cool. We When we went, um, it was nap time. Um, most of them were asleep, but he finally woke up. He woke up, ate, uh, ate some more, and then went back to sleep like you know most people do. Uh, we visited a Chinese family. Uh, this is me, Danielle, and Dana. Uh, the daughter on the right, she was already accepted into the university. And when we got to the house, the daughter on the left, she had just got her acceptance letter. Like, it had just got into the mail, and she started to cry, so that was pretty sweet. Next slide. Um, my favorite parts of the trip was actually the traveling. Altogether, we traveled basically for 24 hours. We traveled from Atlanta to Detroit, from Detroit to Tokyo, Japan, from Japan to uh, Beijing. Um, I slept most of the time. I slept through all kind of stuff. Most of the girls were, because uh, I was the only boy to go, most of the girls were uh, flipping out over the turbulence. I was asleep. I was oblivious to everything. Uh, the nightlife was pretty fun. The um, nightlife is fun. They like to party. If you ever watch the show like Jersey Shore, that's the kind of music they play, like uh, David Guetta and stuff like that. They enjoy all kinds of pop music. Cheap prices. Um, everything over there is so much cheaper than it is here. Uh, you know the Beat by Dre headphones? How much do these cost here? Like $250, $300? I got two pair of Beat by Dre headphones for $16. Yeah. Uh, go back, please. Uh, the rock star popularity, they loved us. Uh, we were the first quote unquote African Americans that they ever seen. So they, all they wanted to do was take pictures of us. I swear we should have started charging uh, for pictures because. Uh, we took so many pictures with so many strangers. Um, the food is, Chinese food here and Chinese food there are totally, they're similar but different at the same time. Like uh, my favorite is sweet and sour chicken. And sweet and sour chicken here in America is more sweet than sour, but over there it's more sour than sweet, which was different. Next slide, please. Uh, All together, it was an amazing trip. This is us um, when we uh, first got to Nizami University. Um, it took some getting used to. The first couple of weeks, it did nothing but rain. And then the next two weeks, it was just hot as all get out. I think it hit like 110. It was the highest and went. And uh, this was a trip I'll never forget. Thank you. The classes. I'll briefly go over the classes. We were in classes all day, just Monday through Thursday. And it got a little bit hectic. And we were tired all the time, but it was actually quite interesting. The top left picture is of a guy from Wales. He's a teacher. And pretty much what he did was he talked about why it was important that, he, that students um, have a connection with China. The middle picture, top picture, is from Dr. Osakwe, intercultural communication class. That was our final. And she was just writing away. And we're all just looking like, it's our final. Why do we have to have so much work? But in the end, it was okay. We made it through. The top right picture is of our lecture teacher. Now, our lecture teacher, he would go on and on and on, and he really didn't care, um, really, whether or not we were listening. But we tried to pay attention. We found out a lot of interesting thing about, things about China. One thing about China that I didn't know that stood out is that there's a desert side, the industrial side, the popular side. It's so many sides to China. The bottom left picture is when I got my degree, well, not degree, but our little diploma saying that we graduated from the study abroad program. And also I have a picture of us doing calligraphy. The excursions, um, pretty much we went to the Hakka House, the Forbidden City, which was, had like a whole bunch of different like courtyards, it was just courtyards upon courtyards. And that was actually one of my favorite excursions. The middle picture is at the Port of Shima where they import and export different things into China. The bottom picture on the left is just me at the Great Wall of China. I didn't climb as high as everyone else did because I am so afraid of heights. But it was still an interesting sight. And also the picture on the right is where they have the Olympics and that's the swimming bubble. We went to an island, a Taiwanese island, and we had wine. We, the, the top right picture is of us outside the Great Wall. The bottom left picture is at the square. And the bottom right photo is when we was in Jiamen and, not 
Jamin? Jamin. Okay, and we were right next to a tomb where it was um, a turtle. It, the, um, it was like a statue of a turtle with the tomb underneath it with the headstone of an actual casket, which was weird. The Chinese people were very nice. Wherever we went, they always tried to feed us and give us things to eat. We went to conferences. They would give us peanuts, sunflower seeds, tea, fruit. The middle photo is of, is of me and Dr. Osakwe as we went to a host family. They wanted us to eat so much. I guess they had a perception that Americans eat a lot, and they just kept trying to shove food our way, and we're like, no, thank you, but we didn't want to be rude, so we took as much as we could. The bottom, oh, go back. the bottom left photo was just of a festival they had, and also they had signs for us wherever we went, welcome students and faculty of Albany State University study abroad. The people were very friendly, very nice. Um, I'll just briefly go through the top left pictures of a guy named Alex who was the desk worker in our building. He was really awesome, really sweet, and very helpful. The top right photo is of three of my classmates, Jessica, Jared, and I. We met students who were um, students of Shyman who did know English, and they were um, interacting with us back and forth. The bottom left photo is of us um, talking to the middle school students at, the lo at a local school who did live on campus. As well, the bottom right photo is of a guy, is a little boy who had never seen African Americans. So to be surrounded by five black women, they were, he was just like amazed and he was so sweet. The food. I can honestly say I did continue eating American food, but I did try the Chinese. Um, one thing I didn't know, what I thought was interesting, was when I came home, I was telling my parents, telling everybody, oh, I had Mighty Wings from McDonald's. They never had chicken wings. But by the time I came back to Georgia, they had had them. So I was just like, well, China was the first people to have it. So I thought that was interesting. The pizza is considered, it looks large just because it's like cheese and all that, but that is considered like a large, extra large pizza at Pizza Hut. That's considered a medium-sized pizza to us. It was very small. The bottom left picture, whenever we went to like restaurants, we ate on the Lazy Susan. If anyone know what a Lazy Su Susan is, you put the food on the um, Lazy Susan and you just turn it. And the only thing about that is you have to hope that you can get whatever you wanted. A lot of people was just going for whatever they could get. And that was frustrating. The bottom right photo is of shrimp. With the shrimp, they had the gristles, the eyes, the shell, the tail. They had everything in it, and I was grossed out at first. But I love shrimp, so eventually it got to the point where they would eat the whole thing. Me, no, I would sit there, pick, pick everything apart, and it was messy. And I know they thought I was so messy, but I wasn't going to eat everything. Um, this is just the street food, the fruit they blend it up for you. They had the chicken, the corn on the cob, the green beans on a stick, the rolls on a stick, and that was actually good. They had the fresh fruits that were a little salty, but they were still good. My favorites of the trips was, just like Jared said, you're a rock star. Everyone is just like amazed that you're American, especially if you're African American, they just think of you as royalty, you're beautiful. Um, another thing, I had another picture of Alex in the middle, and he was just really awesome and helpful, and that was my little Chinese boyfriend there. The top right photo is of me and three other classmates. We got very close, and it was just nice to just interact with people. We had an experience that we shared with each other. You felt rich, like Jared said, you had all this money. For their money, it was six yen to our US dollar, so we did feel pretty rich over there. The middle bottom picture is, I felt so independent. I would just go anywhere and just feel like I just owned anywhere I went. I love that. And the bottom right photo is just of anywhere you go, you're gonna have a beautiful background. But you're also gonna have a lot of people in your pictures, no matter what, so I just got used to it, and I consider them just assets to the picture as well. If you want a true experience, ride the bus. The bus is something I do want to talk about. No matter how packed that bus got, 
the bus driver would let people just come in and you would just be just stuck all on each other. You would sit and you'd have a Chinese person right in your face and it's awkward because you're different and they're looking at you and you're looking at them. You're trying not to look, but they're still looking. They don't care. They're going to keep looking at you. Everywhere you went, there was matching couples. It was so sweet. I just wanted to be in love in China. Just people getting married anywhere. It was just crazy. I've never seen that before. On behalf of President Freeman, the Director of Global Programs, our Interim Provost, Dr. Green, we really want to thank you, Albany Middle, for coming out. You know you're young, but if you can just start thinking about this early, you can be prepared and you can see the world. Now, quickly before you leave, before you get back on the bus and get back to school for that delicious lunch. Y'all ready for lunch? Yeah. Uh-uh, no. What, <laughs> what are you having for lunch today? Ooh. <laughs> Capital F or lowercase f? Oh, Capital F or lowercase f? Capital F. It should be good. We're going to go ahead and give out our awards for our study abroad students and also our faculty that went this year. If I can have Mr. Clavin Williams come up and assist me. I should say Commander Clavin Williams. This is one of our benefactors of global programs. He helps us out. Thank you, Mr. Williams. All right, Global Achievement Award, Mr. Jared Heath. <laughs> Global Achievement Certificate, Ms. Danielle Wilcoxon. Global Achievement Certificate, Ms. Bianca Ward. Global Achievement Certificate, Ms. Sonique O'Neill. <laughs> now, Ms. Ward, I'm sorry, Ms. O'Neill, stay right there. We have something else for you. This is on behalf of the Director of Global Programs, Dr. Osakwe, was so very impressed by you and all that you've done. She wants to present you with the Best All-Around Study Abroad Student 2012 Award. <laughs> and we have one more plaque that we want to give out. And this was actually the students, all of the study abroad students who went to China this year, they voted for this award. So this was a peer award. This is for Ms. Danielle Wilcoxon. She was voted the best adapted student in China this year. And also on behalf of our administration and the Office of Global Programs, we'd like to present Dr. Zhou, Assistant Director, Jiamen University, China Summer Study Abroad 2012.
So once again, thank you all for coming out and, and joining us and, and celebrating our students. We hope that one day at you, whether you go to Albany State or wherever you choose to go, get out there, see the world, don't be afraid. It's going to help you in the long run, I promise you. And we hope to see you at our International Education Week this year, which runs October 8th through October 12th. Thank you.